we have um, a very diverse spectrum of crop success that uh, my colleague John showed you. And what I'm going to try to do is tell you how we deliver that broad crop spectrum success reproducibly and affordably with a simple solution. And it's um, been 20 years into this, and I think it's important for you to understand uh, <clears throat> what we offer and, and why it does what it does. So as we talk about the product science, <clears throat> first I want to state that we are CFIA approved. Uh, we got that approval back in June, and uh, that was a lot of paperwork. Um, but it's good through 2020 and easily renewed after that. So um, we're not only uh, organic certified, uh, CFIA approved, we're, we're working through this in a lot of countries, and we've done a very good job with that. The topic really is plant growth promoting bacteria. Uh, you'll hear me talk about PGPBs and then other versions of that. Uh, PGPBs are relevant to the rhizosphere. It's a narrow region of soil, uh, maybe one to five millimeters around the root, uh, and it's directly influenced by root secretions and the microbial activity, and it's very different than the bulk soil. You'll see all sorts of different uh, relationships published between fungi and bacterial populations in the rhizosphere and in the bulk soil. So it's, it's a very unique, very important region. The important point to remember is that uh, anytime we dose, whenever we can deliver the bacteria to the rhizosphere early on, uh, the better we can do that, the better our, our application is. Now, this type of research, bacteria for plants, it's been ongoing for 20 years, mostly in universities. Um, it's not yet in the mainstream of agriculture, but we're working to bring it there. The interesting thing is, and it's the way academia works, is almost all the research thus far has been with pure strains. And that makes sense because it's almost impossible to isolate variables when you have mixed cultures and so forth. So, um, you know, almost everything done so far has been with pure strain organisms. And what I'm gonna do is just give you some brief examples of selected pure strain bacteria that happen to match some of the strains that we have in our products so that you see the basis from where we're coming. In terms of the functions, there's a lot going on with how bacteria act to promote plant growth. And in terms of the mechanism of the action you have, on the left side, you've got direct promotion. And these functions include fixing nitrogen, taking N2 out of the air and making it available to plants, phosphorus solubilization, uh, potassium solubilization, something called siderophore production, which is just a way to help bring iron in iron poor soils into the plant, phytohormones, those are growth hormones, uh, auxins, cytokinins, th those are all things that some bacteria will do that are generally recognized as that's how bacteria and fungi can help promote plant growth. Now there's also indirect growth promotion and that's on the right hand side and you see antibiotics and hydrolytic enzymes. Uh, John talked a little bit about fungi and nematodes. Uh, some of the things that we do uh, are very active in helping combat fungal affections and nematode problems. Uh, there's also improved plant resistance. And uh, I'm going to talk more about the direct side of things though, the, the direct plant growth promotion traits. The first one that we listed was nitrogen fixation. And there's an organism called Rhodocytomonas palustris. Um, it's better known as the red guy, as you can see in, in the photo. What this organism does is, is probably more things than any one bacterium does, but it's really, really good at fixing nitrogen. Uh, 
it can work aerobically, anaerobically, digest such a wide variety of organic compounds, but it does a fantastic job of pulling nitrogen out of the atmosphere and making it available to plants. Equally important to the nitrogen, nitrogen fixation is phosphor solubilization. Everybody knows plants get phosphorus primarily from either the monobasic or dibasic phosphate, the orthophosphate form. That's what's bioavailable. But when you apply fertilizer, all the different reactions that occur can immobilize the phosphorus and make it non-available. So there is a lot of research going on with phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. And there's a big movement to introduce those to the agricultural community as basically as a phosphate biofertilizer. Here's a couple examples. Uh, this, this is from um, a recent uh, biotechnology advances journal. Here we have a Bacillus subtilis, which is a very common organism. In this plate that you see, all the white uh, opaque material, that's tricalcium phosphate. That's basically insoluble, a common form in the soil. It's not bioavailable to the plant. You take one Bacillus subtilis organism, grow it on that plate, and that little clear area around it indicates that that organism is dissolving the tricalcium phosphate and turning it into orthophosphate, or the bioavailable form. And I put this picture up because uh, this is one of the tricks that we use to train our bacteria to do what we need them to do. And this uh, type of thing is uh, something that we do with all our species. We'll briefly mention siderophores. Uh, when iron is in short supply, bacteria can secrete small proteins that encapsulate or sequester iron, and then the plant easily pulls that in. So it's a way for a good symbiosis uh, where the bacteria helps bring relatively deficient iron into the plant. So it's a, a, a big area of research. And you can see here from a Genome Biology Journal, uh, they talk about a bacillus like Caniformis doing this function very, very well. And so far I've mentioned the red guy and the bacillus subtilis and the bacillus like Caniformis. You'll, you'll see the pattern going as, as we proceed. Going down on the direct action, we saw phyto phytohormones. Those are your growth hormones, your auxins, your gibberellins, your cytokinins. Uh, what these do is they really help boost root growth. And what we have here is um, uh, use of a bacillus subtilis, which does a great job of producing the phytohormones and treating lettuce. And you see the uh, solid line and a dash line. The solid line is always without the bacillus and a dashed line is with the bacillus and you see both in terms of the uh, roots and the shoots that when the bacillus subtilis was added the uh, growth was improved and, it, and in this particular study I didn't give all the details this is plant and soil uh, journal that that was uh, purely attributed to the phytohormone released by the bacillus. I think we've all heard of nitrifying bacteria we use them all the time in our lake treatment uh, nitrifying bacteria, what they're commonly known to do is take ammonia and turn it into nitrate. We mostly uh, understand that nitrate is a preferred nitrogen source for plants, especially once you get past germination. So we include that in our product as well, but nitrifying bacteria, uh, one of the things that we have learned that I don't think is widely understood yet is that it acts in many other ways as plant growth promoting bacteria. Here we have uh, a, an example from Journal of American Science just a couple years ago. Uh, the study showed that the nitrifiers, while they did not make growth hormones, while they did not make siderophores, they did solubilize phos phosphorus. And that was a big surprise uh, to them. We, we, we actually knew that at the time. But when you take, when this researcher took 
the nitrifiers and compared it uh, basically in tomato plants and look at, at the growth from five to 30 days. And they used a relatively poor phosphorus soil. They had uh, version A, which was just uh, garden biofertilizer where you, at 30 days, you reached 11 centimeters growth. Uh, they had azotobacter, which we do not use, but that's a nitrogen fixer. Uh, that did pretty well at, at, after 30 days, it got up to 14. And you see nitrobacter and nitrosomonas, those are both nitrifying bacteria alone. They also got up to 14 and they attributed that purely to the P solubilization, making the phosphorus more available. Interestingly enough, uh, this researcher combined um, the nitrogen fixer, the azotobacter, with the nitrosomonas, the P solubilizer, and that one did the best. So you can see down in um, uh, number E, letter E, that that got up to almost 16 centimeters, and that this was all an average over you know, um, many, many plants that they were evaluating. We have a, a second uh, example of this where there's again some combination work uh, going on. This is um, out of Malaysia. They used the nitrifying bacteria sometime with the rhodocytomonas and what they found was that the nitrosomonas surprisingly did a really good job in germination and in combining it with the red guy, the rhodocytomonas, it did even better. So what we've talked about so far are five key bacteria. Uh, two different bacillus, two different nitrifiers, and the red guy. That probably uses the words the best. And with those five, and they're listed right here, uh, we have 21 years of growing, stabilizing them, putting them in a bottle at a high concentration so we can ship them around the world. And the university research I pulled up and showed you uh, was specific to those five species. So it's not like we copied that, it's just there for support and you know anybody can Google away and, and, and find the same type of uh, research being done with those and other bacteria. But part of our success is the ability to take those five, put them into a stable formula mixture and have it be good literally for two years as we have to ship stuff everywhere around the world. But that's only part of our bag of tricks. One of the things I want to stress here, and, and I think everybody's heard of um, growing their own bacteria, making compost tea, a, a, a lot of things come to mind. I want people to understand what bacteria really want to do. Um, as far as they want to do anything, they want to grow and reproduce as fast as possible. And why is that? Uh, this here is just um, a math example. We have one bacteria of type A in the center, one bacteria of type B over on the right hand side. And just for sake of discussion, bacteria A is fast. It doubles every 30 minutes. So it goes from two to four to eight, to 16, to 32, every 30 minutes. Bacteria B takes 60 minutes, just for discussion. Well, look what happens just after five hours. You have over a thousand of type A, and you just have 32 of type B. So the point I wanna make with this is we talked about making growth hormones and making siderophores and having the mechanism to uh, Cybolize phosphorus and fixing that, all those things that are so important, that's machinery that the bacteria has to build in and maintain. And if someone just takes a bucket of molasses and takes some compost and bubbles it away for a while, all you're doing is growing bacteria as fast as you can. And the guys that, <coughs> maybe they're grow bacteria too, I, the bacteria will just grow and duplicate and the ones that reproduce the fastest dominate very quickly. As you can see, you got 3% left of type B relative to type A in just this five hour period. So when you just randomly grow bacteria with the idea of throwing a lot of bugs at something, you're succeeding in numbers, but you're losing the important traits. 
and we talked about all those things that were on the left-hand side, the nitrogen fixation, the P-solubilization, the hormone production, all of that, that's all extra machinery that's important. We have a lot of tools that we've built over the last 20 years to make sure all the strains that go into our product have those key functions that we know are important. So you saw the earlier picture of the plate with the white, milky, insoluble phosphorus and the little area of clearing. Tricks like that and many others we use to make sure that all the important functional traits, those things that directly promote plant growth, are there for each of our bacteria. And we do have customers who say, well, okay, we'll try your stuff, it worked great. Well, next season I'm gonna keep a gallon around and I'm gonna grow it on sugar. And it happens and they lose their results for the reason that I'm talking about right now. You know, we've done combinations of adding our bacteria onto manure spreaded fields, uh, compost tea spreaded fields. The extra performance is always there not because it's more bacteria, or not because it's different strains, but because we've built in to what goes in the bottle strains with the exact right functions. And, and that's a difficult thing to do, and it's taken us over two decades to get to that point. Sort of a summary, this is our bacterial plant growth promotion fingerprint. You've got the five organisms that are in the ACFSR, and for all the functions I talk about, uh, this little chart shows which of the bacteria are performing them. Uh, the key is that all the, the main functions are included with the product and we guarantee that. And the fact that John Morrell is getting great results in drought and in strawberries and in avocados and wheat and corn, well, the reason is not every situation needs all those functions, but if the function's necessary, we provide it. And no one has the time or the money or the effort to go study every soil, every rhizosphere, and decide what's missing. So we found an economic, dependable, stable way to add all the functions into one product in a stable form so that it's gonna work almost all the time. And, and that's a completely different situation compared to the random idea of growing bacteria f with sugar, molasses, compost, et, et cetera. We also offer flexibility and economy. Now, we have and we have sample bottles over there and I think uh, Phyllis, we're inviting people to take a sample with them and give it a test on whatever house plants they have or whatever but we offer ready to use product and samples are over there for smaller farms and high value crops. We also offer uh, what we call a BCM, which will be demonstrated for you later. That's our bacteria culturing monitor. And with this, large farms can actually take concentrated bacteria and nutrients from us and brew up with the dependability of the real time monitoring and be able to apply all those key functions to massive acreage. And a couple of gentlemen uh, who are here today will discuss what they've done with that. So it's really the first time, uh, this is the first year we, we feel that uh, large farms have been able to use our materials in, in a really economical way. Mm -hmm.